Thank you again, my dear friends, for choosing to be with us tonight. Well, you've made the best choice to be with us. You will see for yourself why I say that. I'm going to go directly on the screen, if you don't mind, and we'll share with you the slide for tonight's pr preparation. There we go. Wonderful. So my dear friends, if there's anybody right now who is watching through Facebook, welcome. We're so glad you made that choice to join us tonight. May God bless your heart. As we have heard um, in the announcement by our brother Jay, uh, tomorrow it won't be at 7, at 7 p.m. Tomorrow night, you will have a free night again with the family with the friends, sharing your faith, finding more friends for Sunday. You know why? Let me tell you something. We've just completed two weeks. That's a miracle. We, we can complete two weeks, by the way, tomorrow. So please don't miss tomorrow morning at 11. Please make a sacrifice. You don't want to miss that. I'm going to present to you a message that we no longer hear in Christianity anymore. Satan has done a wonderful, which is a terrible job, in hiding a most profound truth, beautiful truth that God so much wants everyone to hear. So tomorrow, you don't want to miss. In fact, from now on, tonight, until the end of our series, I'm going to deal with some topics that you've never heard, some of you. For example, tomorrow, you want to come, I'm going to bring to you to light something that has been hidden. That, the, that, that you need in order to prepare yourself for heaven. Yes, we need Jesus, but when we have Jesus, you will see tomorrow, Jesus will lead us to something so that that something will help us to prepare for heaven. Amen. Don't miss tomorrow at 11. Second, we, we're going to deal with some topics powerful. Why are there so many differences? In Christianity, we have only one God, one baptism, and yet over 4,000 plus religions in Christianity. Why? There's something wrong. That should not be the case. I'm going to deal with those most important questions from the Bible. We will just stick to the Bible. Therefore, it's not going to be the, word of a man, the words of a man. It's going to be the word of God. Can we say amen? So I'm going, to, I'm going to share why so many religions, why so many differences in Christianity. Some people, for example, they baptize babies. Or they are baptized when they are babies. Some they baptize when they are adults or when they are uh, mature. Some they baptize differently with, with some uh, rose petals on the head. Wow, did you know that? There, there are different ways people are getting baptized. Why? Some they confess to God through Jesus. Some they confess to the, to the church leaders, to the priests. Why so many confusion? Wow. Some keep... Uh, the, 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 the rest day, the Lord's day on Saturday. Some they keep the Lord's day on Sunday. Why is this okay or there's something wrong? Some they say we don't need to keep any days. I'm going to deal with those questions. And like I said before, please feel free to come and be yourself. Nobody's going to force you to believe anything. God has created us free. And we've got to respect that. Nobody should force you. You just come and you listen and you write notes and you go and check for yourself if all that you're hearing is from the Bible. Amen? That's the problem today. Many people are listening to whoever comes with a Bible. They think that it's from God. No, we've seen that. Satan comes with a Bible today. Satan has been a Bible student for years. That's why he used tricks to get to our hearts. He used counterfeit truths. Mm. So we're going to see why those many religions. And we're going we're gonna to talk also about, about um, what happens when you die. Some people have asked me the question, what happens when we die? Do we go to heaven or do we go to the earth and we stay there or nothing happens? Will there be a resurrection? Will there be a judgment? So we're going to deal with that. Some people have asked me about the beast of Revelation. What is the beast all about? The mark of the beast. Some are afraid that the vaccination is the mark of the beast. The vaccination that, 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 that people have to take today, they think it's the mark of the beast. Some, they say it's a little chip you put in your body. I want to talk about that. The millennium, the 1,000 years that Revelation speaks about. What is this about? 
I'm telling you folks, before the living God, the best is yet to come. This coming week, next week, starting from tonight, tomorrow, please, if you have an appointment tomorrow at 11, cancel your appointment. And I'm telling you that in the name of God, because you have you are having an appointment with Jesus tomorrow at 11. He wants to share something with you that you will need to go and share with your mother, with your father, with your families. It is a big truth that Satan has attacked. And I'm going to show you this tomorrow. Don't miss it. Amen. Let me start right now. My dear friends, when Jesus was on earth. The Bible says that everywhere he would go, a great crowd will follow him. Everywhere Jesus will go with his disciples, you see clearly from the Bible, it's a big number of people following him. In fact, in that big group of people, was, there were two categories. First of all, there was a mass, the big crowd, and among the mass, there was a little group of people known as the disciples. Mm. What's the difference between the two? We read in Luke, for example, chapter 6, 17 and mm -hmm. over, coming down off the mountain with them, he, Jesus, stood on a plain surrounded by disciples. This is that small group here among the big crowd who used to follow Jesus surrounded by disciples and was soon joined by a huge crowd or congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem. They had come both to hear Jesus and to be cured of their ailments, of their sicknesses. Right, my dear friends, notice the crowd or the multitude or the congregation that the Bible speaks about here. They came to Jesus to do two things. One, to hear Jesus, and secondly, to be healed. Well, they had come to hear some inspired preaching because Jesus was a very good preacher. They came to hear a motivational speaker, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to come and hear a good speaker. But notice the second reason they came for, to be cured. They came to be healed, and there's nothing wrong with that either. For they were in need of healing. And at some point in time, we all need something in our lives from Jesus. Can we say amen? But unfortunately, many people were following Jesus only for him to meet their needs. For him to do something for them. They were there for some personal gains. Not because they truly loved him. Are you listening? Some were following Jesus, yes, for healing, others for food, because Jesus sometimes they were, he was multiplying the bread and the fishes. You remember that? So some were poor and they came for that, just for that. And that's it, unfortunately. The moment they had their food, they left Jesus, and then they came back again whenever there were physical food. Are you with me? Yes, some came to hear the word of God. But I'm saying to you right now, there is something more than to simply hear God's word. And tonight you will see that what God expects us to do when we hear God's word, his word, is to obey his word. Can we say amen? Mm. So the crowd did not really come to obey, to hear the word in order to obey God's word. They did not come in order to commit themselves to the Lordship of Christ. They did not come in order to hide Jesus in their hearts. Are you listening? No. In fact, among the crowd, there were those who came to see some spectacular miracles. Are you listening? Because Jesus was performing lots of miracles. Many people were being healed in his presence. So there were those who came to be entertained. I can see them carrying their taro chips. Oh, are you listening now, the Samoans? I love your taro chips. They came with their taro chips and with their bottle of Coca-Cola and said to each other, let's go and see what he's going to perform today. So many among the crowds, they came to be entertained. Not because they love Jesus. Are you following? So my friends, as a result, the crowd who followed Jesus was quite large. But the point is this. Are you listening? Though Jesus was touched with all these people, Though he loved them all equally the same, and though he wanted to meet their needs, Christ was not really concerned about the size of the crowd. 
but he was concerned about those who would commit themselves to him. Are we? Are, are you following? Christ was looking for obedience, this willingness to do what he says. Amen. Unfortunately, the crowd followed Jesus on their own terms. They picked and chose, or they picked and chose, pardon me, what they wanted to do. Are you following? They were not seeking to do everything that Jesus was telling them or was teaching them. On the other hand, don't miss that. The disciples were the committed ones. Are you following? They were the ones who truly loved the Lord and were willing to sacrifice everything in order to demonstrate their love for Jesus. Can we say amen? My question to you right now is this. What is Jesus' term all about when it comes to following him? What does it mean, in other words, to be a true disciple? And this is very important, my dear friends. For as we look ahead of Jesus' return, we know his coming is near. We've seen, we've studied the signs of the times. And we know we're living in the last days. My point is this. Unless you and I, we become disciples of Christ, instead of only be among the mass or the crowd of people, unless we become disciples, we will not be saved. So what does it mean to be a disciple right now? And secondly, who are you? Are you a disciple or are you just among the crowd? Let us pray. The title is, loving obedience let us pray father as we close our eyes we acknowledge that you are with us that you are so big and holy that we don't deserve you because all of us including the preacher himself is a sinner and the wages of sin is death we deserve to die god but what a miracle that we are all alive right now and we have learned that we are alive only because of you, of your goodness. Not because we've done anything good, because our goodness and good works cannot save us. Only Jesus and his good works and his, and his obedience can save us. So we want to thank you for Jesus that through him we can come to you, Father. And we ask that you will wash our sins away. Just like my dear beloved prayed before me. Please cleanse us, oh God. Put your spirit in us as we open the Bible. So that we can hear not the voice of a man, but the voice of God. Some maybe have come for the first time. Bless their hearts. They're not sure if they should stay or not. Please bless them. And keep them. And help them to just listen. And may your spirit works within their hearts so that they can identify themselves with what they're going to hear from the Bible. Bless, bless this unworthy but yet chosen vessel. Oh God, I feel so unworthy to speak in your behalf. May you cover me with the righteousness of Jesus so that as I speak, it will be you speaking through me for your glory and for the salvation of your people, including me and my family. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My dear friends, let me begin by gaining your attention on the parable of two builders. It's possible you've already read this parable. It's not that big. Here you will see Christ. He will separate the true disciples from the crowd. Are you following? He will split the camps of those who call themselves Christians into two. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. Therefore, Jesus starts the parable. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, are you listening? Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, 
and it fell with a great crash. I think the parable is quite clear, my dear friends. Two builders, one built on the right foundation, a rock, and the other one, no, it was on sand. When the rain came down, of course, the one on the rock stood firm until the end, but the one who was built on sand came down with a crash. My question to you right now is this. First question, who are the two builders that Jesus was referring to? Especially the one built on sand. Let's just think about that. Mm. I used to think that the one building on the rock, they were the Christians. And the one building on sand, they were the people of the world. But I was deadly wrong. My dear friends, notice who are those building on sand. Notice verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. Wow, in other words, who are these people? These are the, of course, those built on sand. They hear the words of God. In other words, these are people who are exposed to the Bible truth. These are Christians. They hear God's word every weekend when they go to church. On, they hear God's word on Zoom every night, maybe. But the problem is that they choose not to obey God's word. So the one building on sand, please get it right. These are not wretched sinners or some atheists who do not believe in God. Both builders are believers. Both are exposed to the Bible. They hear the word of God, but they do not obey it. And especially these are the ones building on sand. Whereas the one building on the rock, they hear the word, you will see later on, but they practice, they obey the word. Wow. So both are Christians, but only one is genuine. In all the words, here we are seeing the two categories of people who used to follow Jesus. The crowd, they follow Jesus. But unfortunately, they were not willing to really practice what they heard from Jesus. Are you with me? Whereas the disciples, they were that little group among the crowds who would obey God. In fact, in fact, notice how Jesus started the parable. Are you ready? He started the parable with the word, therefore. Huh? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice and, and so on. Therefore, what is the meaning of the word therefore? Each time when you see the word therefore, what does it mean? Well, therefore is, means, is simply a bridge. It's a word that connects what has been said before to what will be, what will be, what will be said after. So therefore, it's right in the middle to connect what Jesus was saying before to what he said after. Are you there? In other words, Jesus was saying something before he gave the parable. In fact, he gave this parable in order to explain what he was saying before. Are you with me? So what was Jesus saying before he gave that parable? Are you ready? Check the text. Matthew 7, 24. Let's move to Matthew 7, 21. And let's see 21 to 23. And let's see what Jesus was saying. Are you ready? Notice what Jesus was saying. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Are you listening? Notice not everyone will enter God's kingdom when Jesus returns. Are you following? That's what the Bible says. Only those who truly do the will of my Father are enough for us. It's not enough. Maybe I should stop right there. Somebody speak to me. Yeah, it's, it's cutting. It's cutting. Okay, I'll I'll just well let's let's keep on because if I come out of this, it will just unsettle everything. Let let's keep on. Let's try to keep on. The moment you 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 hear you yeah, hear it's, me cutting. Stop cutting now. Okay. If it cuts again, Joshua, just tell me. Okay. Thank you. So, folks, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Not everyone will be saved. Mm. 
Only those who does the will of the Father. So it's not enough to claim that you love Jesus for you to go to heaven. Amen. We must actually what? Doing God's will. Notice it says here, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. Notice these are Christians, folks. Yes or no? Yes, they're using the name of Jesus. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Amen. So who are these people here? Are you following? Notice, I come back again to the text. Verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, what? Lord, Lord. So these are Christians. For they are claiming Jesus to be their Lord. Wow. They claim Jesus to be their master. In fact, these are not any type of Christians. For they have been doing some wonderful things for Jesus. They said, we have prophesied in your name. Check on the text. We have cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your names. Whoa. So these are people who've been prophesying, casting out demons. Prophesying means can mean preaching or to prophesy, to, to, to foretell of what will happen later on. So prophesy, I've been, we've been, they've been casting out demons. They've been performing miracles. But though they claim to be Christ's followers, they were not. So my question to you right now is this. What will clarify between the true and the false Christians, between the disciples, are you with me, and the crowd? What will, it, what, 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 what will determine this? Let me show you. Let's go, back. Let's go to the next text on Judgment Day. You heard that? In other words, folks, there will be a judgment at the end of the age of the world. And the judgment is what will separate the crowd from the disciples, the true Christians from the false ones. Are you listening? Wow. Well, today, many people are blowing their trumpets, claiming that they love God, that they have a relationship with Jesus, that they are following him. But the Bible says that there will be a final judgment in the end of time. And listen to what God will tell the crowd. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks what? God's law. That's what God will say, even to many Christians on Judgment Day. Mm. So folks, the one building on sand are believers. That's what I want you to see. They are religious people too. They think. They are following God, but unfortunately, they were not. They claimed that Jesus was their Lord. They said to Jesus, yes, I will follow you, Jesus. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you ask me to do. You want me to prophesy? I'll prophesy. You want me to cast out demons? I will cast out demons. You want me to perform miracles? I will do. Of course, the list goes on. You want me to go to church, Jesus? I'll go. You want me to pray to church? Three times a day or two times a day, I'll pray. You want me to give money to the poor? I'll give money to the poor. You want me to do some forms of sacrifice? Do you want me to sing in the choir, Jesus? I'll sing in the choir for you. But guess what? On judgment day, God will reveal their true nature, their true character. Mm. In other words, here Jesus is saying to them, hey guys, it's not enough to do things. It's not enough to cast out demons. It's not enough to prophesy. It's not enough to do miracles. For if you really want to be my disciples, Jesus says, and if you really want to enter my kingdom, wow, what must you do? What must you do? Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. I ask you tonight, are you doing God, God's will, the Father's will? Because that's what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. You will do God's will. So the big question right um, now it's for cutting you, my dear friends, it's is this. Now. What is the will of the Father for that? Well, it's cutting now, huh? So do I say the whole thing now? Let me just step out and we'll do it now. We'll, we'll put another connection, shall we? Yeah. We'll, you don't need to step out, just change it. Thank you. 
Thank you, dear folks, for your understanding. We are not in heaven yet. Did you realize that? And because this is so, we will have problems sometimes on earth. Okay? So even the internet will give us hard times at times. But it has a sycamore tree for us when we preach. Can we say amen? Yes. God has a sycamore tree even when we preach. So let's hope that this time it will work better. Shall we? Okay. Let me go back here. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens here. Okay. Let, I will just have to go a little bit in front. There we go. So here Jesus is saying, it's not enough to do these things. For if you want to be my disciples, and if you want to enter my kingdom, what must you do? You must do the will of my Father in heaven. The big question for us tonight right now is this. What does it mean to do the will of the Father? Do you know what it means? Well, this is when Jesus gives the parable of the two builders. Are you following now? For a true disciple is somebody who's building his house on the rock. Can we say amen? In other words, the will of God is not so much about doing bits and pieces for God in Christianity or in your church. The will of God is not so much about casting out demons or performing miracles, even though sometimes we will need to do that. But that's not the core of God's will. The will of God is about building. Are you listening? It's about constructing something. Are you listening? It's about constructing your house on the rock. Now my next question is this. What is the house all about? I hope you're listening tonight. I hope you're writing tonight. So what is the house all about? Well, my dear friends, the house here simply represents your life and your character. Notice both categories of Christians. The crowd and the disciples, they were building their houses. That is, they were building their lives. They were building their character. Are you listening? Wow. In other words, my dear friends, can I say something? Eternal life is about character building. It's about character development. It's right there in the scripture. It's not simply that I receive Christ in my life. Hallelujah, I'm in heaven. Praise God, the moment you receive Christ. Yes, you receive salvation if you repent of your sin. But it does not stop there. Like we saw yesterday, salvation is a process. Amen. It's receiving Christ. And through Christ, you start to build your life on the rock. Are you listening? Your character on the rock. Amen. Even those Christians, in other words, who are not serious about God, they are building something. It's in the parable. Are you listening? Even the crowd, they were building their lives. But unfortunately, they were building on the wrong foundation. And this is the point. Either you are building your life and your character positively for heaven or for destruction. That's what the Bible is saying. Every choice that we make in life is important. Hence, a true follower of Christ. Are you listening? An authentic disciple of Jesus is building his character positively on the rock of Christ. My question now is this, my next question. Who is the rock? Or what does the rock represent? I think you already know the answer. For those who've been with us for the first night, you know what the rock is all about. Mm -hmm. remember that rock that came and smashed the whole statue represented who christ amen so the rock here that a disciple builds his life on is christ in fact notice notice first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 for they drank talking about israelites when they were crossing the desert there was a time they came to a place where there was no water and there was a big rock and God said to Moses, speak to that rock and water came out. 
Now Paul explains this rock. For they drank, the Israelites, from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So my dear friends, the rock that a disciple, a true disciple, builds his life and character on is none other than Christ. Can we say amen? In fact, this is what we saw in Daniel the coming of the rock. We've just, I've just told you that. And here in this parable, Jesus is showing that a true disciple is one who is building his life and character on him. And I want you to notice that, folks. True Christianity is all about Jesus. Can we say amen? Yes. It's not about other stuff. It's about Christ because Christ is our salvation. He he who is really in a relationship with Jesus, my dear friends, is somebody who is connected to Christ. He is building his life on Christ and Christ alone. That is what true religion is all about. That's what true spirituality is all about. He's someone who loves Jesus and who follows him. He's not someone who's following another person. Are you listening? Or a person from his church. Or from his religion. In fact, that's what I need to tell you right now, folks. As much as some of you are enjoying the sermons that I'm preaching, I'm just a man. And your allegiance should never be to a man. It must always be to Christ. Can we say amen? I'm just a man today. I'm here. Tomorrow, I'm not here. Maybe I'm sleeping, waiting for Jesus to come. Maybe I'm somewhere else, preaching somewhere else. Our allegiance must always be to Christ. Can we say amen? The moment you start to follow a man, or the moment a preacher or a pastor or a priest starts to drag you to himself, this is no longer Christianity. It's a sect. It's, that's a cult. Are you following? A true person who's building his life for heaven, who's preparing himself for eternity, his goal is Christ. He wants Christ. He wants to glorify God. He wants to glorify Christ. He's someone who's following Jesus. And that's what true religion is all about. Christ is his religion. Christ is his everything. Can we say amen? And now what does it mean to build your life and character on Jesus? How do we build our lives on Christ? How do we connect to Jesus? How do we develop our personal relationship with Christ? How do we grow and experience character development? Let's read on. Notice this. Don't miss that. We're still in the same parable. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. Are you here? Are you listening? Hearing the words of Jesus, not the words of a man. The words of Jesus. Where do we find the words of Jesus? In the Bible. So, therefore, everyone who hears the word of Christ and puts them into practice. Don't miss that. Everyone. It's not only hearing, but putting God's word into practice. In other words, it's obedience. Here. Everyone who does that is like a man who built his house on the rock. In other words, my friend, you and I, you will build your life and character on Jesus only when you go to the word and you obey what you hear from the word. Can we say amen? That's obedience. In other words, a true disciple of Christ who is building on Christ the rock is someone who is serious about the Bible, about what the Bible says. He who has a relationship with Jesus is someone who's studying the Bible, who's studying the Bible diligently, who's meditating upon the Bible, and who's putting the Bible into practice. And that's what the building on Christ, the rock, is all about. It's to have Christ and his word as our authority. Did you hear what I just said? It's to have Christ and his word as our authority. Whereas, are you listening? Building on sand whoa, is to build your life and your character upon some other forms of authority. Not the word, but some other forms of authority. Are you listening? In fact, I want you to notice 
who was behind those Christians who were building their lives on sand? Are you ready? Please buckle up. Who were, uh, who was behind, should I say again, behind those people who were building their lives on sand? That is, those who were basing their Christianity on prophesying, casting out demons, and doing miracles. Where did these people or the crowd get their teachings from? Who was behind their teachings? Because they were deceived. They thought that they'd been casting out demons. Uh, because they'd been casting out demons, prophesying, and doing all. They thought they were ready. That's why on Judgment Day, they say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out? They're saying to Jesus, we've done everything you told us. But Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. They were deceived. So where did they get their teaching? Well, first of all, let me let us read again what we have already read. There it is. Matthew 7, 21, 22. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God or heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So here are those who've been building on sand. They use the name of God to their own advantage, but they were not obeying God. So here are those Christians who have been focusing on prophesying, casting out demons, doing miracles. To them, this is what the will of God was all about. Are you with me? But now notice where did, did these Christians get their teachings from? Are you ready now? Let's read a few lines before verse 21, and you will know why. Which one? Let's go from, to verse 15. Jesus says, beware of what? False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Whoa! Essentially, my dear friends, these were false prophets, false preachers, false pastors, false revivalists. They were the ones who were leading those Christians astray, leading them to believe that following God was all about prophesying, casting out demons, doing miracles. Are you following that it was all about doing spectacular stuff. And that's a false gospel in itself. It was those false prophets that were teaching the crowd. The, in other words, the crowd, they were getting their informations from false teachers too. Of course, mingle with what Jesus was saying too. So friends, those building on sand represent the crowd. And these are the superficial Christians who have been listening what others say, what the false prophet says, what preacher says, what false teacher says, what false pastor says, uh, what false pastors were teaching. Are you following? They were listening to men instead of to God. Wow. They were listening to what their conscience was saying instead of what the Bible was saying. Are you listening? Instead of reading and studying the Bible for themselves and obeying its truths, they have been listening to what people say, what their churches were saying. They've been listening to their church leaders, their church leaders giving false prophecies. They were, they've been watching them performing some theatrical display of casting out demons and performing false miracles, and they believed in these people. And this is what we see everywhere today, am I right? Oh, my dear friends, we see that even on TV stations today. And like we already saw, this is a major sign of the times. Jesus said it in Matthew 24, verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, showing great signs and miracles to deceive. We've reached that time now. That is why I say to you tonight, my dear friends, the Bible is warning us about false Christ and false prophets. For in the last days, there will be many of them who will come in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, using the name of Jesus, but spreading their false teachings within Christianity and in the world at large. False teachings that will deceive thousands of people, and among them will be many Christians, the crowd. And you know who's behind them, these false prophets. Do you know? 
It's Satan, of course. Satan knows that his time is short. We've studied this text in Revelation 12, 12. That soon God will throw him into the lake of fire. And so he will do everything he can with the help of his fallen angels, which the Bible calls evil spirit or deceptive spirits to lead thousands in believing in a false gospel, in a counterfeit form of discipleship. Many will end up building on sand. Are you listening? Instead of on God. False teachings. In fact, no, notice what the Bible says. Listen to this. This will shock you, but it's right there in the Bible. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow decept, deceiving spirits and doctrines taught by demons. Many in Christianity, they will leave the teachings of Jesus and believe in doctrines taught by demons. Lord have mercy. Yes, they will remain in Christianity while they are following deceptive spirits. Deceptive doctrines. Doctrines of demons. You see now how important it is for us folks to filter everything that we hear through the word of God. Because there are many the spirit Clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow this, and they will teach those false doctrines. And as a result, they will build their lives on sand. Now you understand why there is so much religious confusion in our world tonight. And within Christianity itself. Why? Because there are all sorts of spirits out there. All sorts of teachings in the last days. And that's because through deceptive spirits, Satan will lead thousands and millions to embrace doctrines taught, not by our Lord, but by demons. False Christian doctrines. Oh, my dear friends, in this great conflict between good and evil that we spoke about a couple of days ago, between Christ and Satan, which started in heaven, in that great war between good and evil, while God is using godly men to advance his kingdom on earth by proclaiming the truth, on the other hand, the devil will be using carnal, sinful, worldly pleasure, worldly people, pleasure-loving people to advance his kingdom of darkness on earth. Satan will use false prophets to teach lies and to deceive people. And among them will be many of those who call themselves Christians. Those who claim Jesus to be their Lord. In fact, in fact, can I say something right now? Please take your camera, or take your pen and write this down. There are four unreliable authorities that we all need to be careful of. Are you listening? These are four authorities that false prophets will use to deceive people. Are you ready? Buckle up your belt. First of all, there is what we call culture. What is culture all about? Everyone is doing it. Some people, they come and tell me, they say, Pastor, what you're saying is true. It's in the Bible. But you know what? I would prefer to go to the, the group there because everyone is doing that. Are you listening? That's the crowd. That's how the crowd talks. Because the disciple will say, listen, even though the majority is over there and all of them are doing the same thing, I would rather do what God tells me to do in the Bible. Can we say amen? That's discipleship. And then there's another one, very dangerous, tradition. What is tradition? We've always done it that way. Tradition is the invention of men creeping into Christianity and bringing to Christians, another form of God's word, a counterfeit truth, but it's man behind it. And many people have been following traditions for years, and they don't want to let go. We've always done it that way, Pastor, so we will not change. And that's the crowd, if your thinking is that way. There's another one, reason. Which means it seems logical. Many people, instead of following what the Bible says, they follow 
their intellect, their, in their conscience, their reasoning. Are you following? And then there's another one, emotions. What is emotion all about? It just feels right. Many people in Christianity today, they base their, felt, their, their, their discipleship upon what they feel. Their feelings. Whatever they feel, they do. I tell you, my friends, Satan is leading millions captive through these four unreliable authorities. Are you listening? And these four authorities are what building on sin is all about. Amen. These, they are essentially the teachings of men, including men's philosophy, including psychology. Oh, my dear friends, I tell you, all these four authorities are flawed. It includes the teachings of pastors and preachers, but who are not teaching what the Bible says, but they're teaching what tradition says, what the church has been saying for years. I tell you again, these four authorities are flawed because they come from men. And like we saw before, men are spiritually blind. You cannot follow men because men are blind. And if you follow blind men, it's the blind leading the blind. And what happens next? Secondly, men are self-centered. Sin has marred our nature. Hence, we cannot depend on these four authorities coming from men. Yes, there are some good traditions in Christianity, and we can use them, praise God. I've seen them everywhere I go. There are some good cultural practices, by the way, that we can practice as Christians. But we must always be careful in not following them just like that. We've got to filter everything that comes from tradition and custom by the word of God. Can we say amen? Why? Because some of these traditions, some of these cultures, in fact, I'm going to deal with some of these traditions that have crept in Christianity. And today, many sincere Christians are following traditions instead of following God's word. And they're being led astray. The problem is that many of these traditions are directly opposite to what scripture teaches for this reason what we need right now is a perfect standard that will never lead us in the wrong direction can we say amen and it is only god's word that meets that need the bible says proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 every word of god is flawless can we say amen whoa Every word of God. For this reason, can I say something? A true child of God, a true disciple of Christ will not follow these four authorities coming from man. Instead, he will follow God's word alone. He will filter anything that he hears from the pulpit or from the Zoom meeting or from the YouTube or from the internet. He will filter everything that he hears by the word of God. Amen? Why? Notice this, notice this. What does it mean to be a true disciple? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. Shall we say amen? Wow. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Can we say amen? Oh, my dear friends, this is so important for us to understand that the word of God is at the heart of a true disciple's life. And obedience to the word is what shows that he's on the narrow road leading to heaven. Amen. You see how important the word is? It sets you free, it says. Do you see why obeying the word is so important? Because it's only when we obey the word that we are being set free. Can we say amen? It sets us free from self, from sin, and from the pleasures of the world. And this freedom comes especially, I say it again, when we obey its instructions, amen? How does it work? Let me show you briefly how does it work. How are we set free as Christians on our way to heaven? How do we develop character for heaven? Notice 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture, in other words, all the Bible, the whole Bible is inspired by God. So it's not only the New Testament, the whole Bible, the Old and the New Testament. Some people, they don't want to hear about the Old Testament. They say it was for the, the Jews 
Let me tell you something. When Paul was writing this, there was not even the, the New Testament yet. They were compiling, still compiling the New Testament. And so here, what Paul was really referring to was the, the Old Testament. It says all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. I want you to see that. What does the Bible do? It teaches us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong where? In our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Do you see how it works? Oh, my dear friends, first of all, as you study the word, as you listen to the word, it teaches us what is true, the Bible says. And secondly, it makes us realize what is wrong in our lives. In other words, the Bible is there not only to show us Jesus so that we can fall in love with him, but it's there to help us to unmask Satan's deception. Are you listening? Those things that we have been practicing all the days of our lives, those cultural practices. Those practices of the world, those traditions, religious traditions we've been practicing, those false bad emotions that come into our lives. So the word of God unmasks those practices. Amen. The Bible, therefore, is there to help us to bring to light all this bent in our lives, these sinful practices. Stealing, drinking, sexual immorality, drugs, and all these things that we've been taking. So that's what the word does. It, it shows, in fact, sin is a lie. And sin is to practice a lie. Are you listening? In other words, Satan uses these false authorities, those four false authorities, and, and tells us that if you do those sinful practices, those lies, if you practice those lies, you'll be happy. If you still, Satan says, if you still money, you'll be rich and you'll be the man and you'll be happy. Mm. If you lie, you'll get away with it. If you commit adultery with this young girl, you'll be more happy than when you are, than what you're experiencing with your older wife. That's what Satan does. That's what sin is all about. Satan puts those lies in our minds. Adultery. Says, if you take this young blonde girl, woo, you're the man. And finally, you end up with AIDS in the hospital. And a couple of months later, you're six foot under the ground. Sins are lies which Satan puts in our minds, and we end up thinking that we are benefiting from these practices, but they are deadly. And this is what it means to build on sin. It's that we're taking everything from the world, from what man says, from what culture says, from what tradition says, even church traditions, and we build our lives on these lies. And we think we're doing ourselves good, but it's all deception. For your house will soon come down when rain comes against it. In the end, we end up in jail for stealing, or we end up losing our family for committing adultery, or we end up losing our lives. Or, or promiscuity. Or we will end up worshiping another God in following those religious traditions. And it's the word of God, the Bible says, that shows us all these lies. It's there to correct us. Shows us these wrong practices that we've been practicing all these years. But furthermore, the word also offers us a new way of living. Can we say amen? Christ's way of living, God's way, which the Bible calls the truth. And if we obey the truth, it shall set us free. Can we say amen? But now it's only when we choose to obey God's word, to follow his way, to do his will. It's only then that the truth of God's word will set us free. Can we say amen? It's only then that we literally build our house on Christ, our character based upon his word. Can we say amen? In other words, for the house, don't miss that. In other words, for the house to be genuinely built on the rock. First, the house that we have built on sand 
must come down. Amen. In other words, we must de-learn what we have learned in the past from the false prophets, from the false teachers, from false psychology, for, for, from false philosophy. We must de-learn. I don't know if we say de-learn. We must unlearn, maybe, those things that we've learned from false teachings. We must first let go these false authorities, these traditions that are contrary to God's word, these customs that are contrary sinful practices. If we're going to embrace the truth and be set free, we must let go those authorities. For God's goal, the goal of the scripture is this. We're in the same text. God uses the scripture to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Can we say amen? Do you see the function of the scripture? To equip us to do every good works. Just like Jesus did when he was on earth. So that we can glorify God. In everything we do. Can we say amen? In our thinking, in our speaking, in our eating, in our drinking, in our, what we wear, in everything we do. The scripture is there to prepare us, to equip us, to be Christ-like. Unfortunately, folks, are you listening? Many people want to keep on living in sin. Hence, they don't want to be corrected. For this reason, they build on sin. They pick and choose what they want from the Bible. Are you listening? They would rather listen to people who would tell them lies about God. Who would tell them what they want to hear. So that they can continue to practice their own sinful ways. Are you listening? In fact, the Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us that this is what will happen in the last days. Notice, notice what will happen in the last days. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Did you hear that? They would not want to hear the word, the pure word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. Instead, notice what they will do. To suit their own desires, their sinful desires, their carnal desires, their worldly desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. Whoa. To teach them what their itching ears want to hear. Wow. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to meats, to lies. Oh, my dear friends, rather than listening to sound doctrines, many will prefer to listen to meats or to doctrines of demons. For this reason, can I tell you something tonight? If there's a book that Satan hates, it's this book called the Bible. Satan hates the Bible because this book is against him and his kingdom and his deceptions. The Bible unmasks all his schemes and tricks and traps. And in the last days, he will do everything in order to bring people away from this book. In fact, in the great controversy against good, between good and evil, Satan will lead preachers and church leaders to preach truth that is mingled, truths that is mingled with traditions, mingled with culture, mingled with reasoning, mingled with emotions. Are you following? In the last days, Satan will use these preachers to pick and choose from the Bible things that they will not disturb them in their comfort zone. And yet our greatest need today is to know the truth. So, folks, this is the crowd that we saw in the parable. Wow. Do you remember what Jesus would tell them on Judgment Day? Wow. I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's law. The will of God is not to perform miracles. Even though this is important and has its place in Christianity. It's not to prophesy, even though this is important. It's not about casting out demons, first of all, even though this has its place too. The will of God is to keep God's commandments. And that's the sad thing we see here. These people, they've been doing these religious activities 
while underneath they were breaking God's law. They were having an appearance of godliness. They appeared to be religious while their hearts remained towards self, sin, and the world. They were lawbreakers. They've been seeking their own preachers and teachers who would teach them a smooth gospel, a dilute gospel, a gospel that is mingled with traditions, with, with what man says. It's a gospel that will not change your life and character. Why? Because only the word of God can set you free. Can we say amen? And the word of God will set you free as we've seen in the story of Bartimaeus. Only when the spirit of God accompanies you when you study the Bible. Only when the spirit of God fills you when you're hearing the sermon. These people have been seeking for their own preachers to entertain them and make them laugh and jump and do all sorts of crazy things in the church instead of teaching them God's will, the truth that sets people free. Instead of teaching them about holiness, they've been basing everything on happiness. They've been listening to preachers who would pick and choose. And there's something dangerous about this. This kind of religion. Do you know why? Let me close with that. Notice, according to the parable, notice why building on the right foundation is so important. Why? Why is it so important to build our lives and character on the rock, Christ, and his word? Do you know why? Notice what will happen, according to this parable. The rain came down. The streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Wow. In other words, folks, rain will come. Storms will come. Can I say something? There will be storms coming soon if it has not come against you. Storms will come in order to test every house. Did you hear that? Like it or not, the rain and the winds will come. Problems and trials will come to test every single so-called Christian. And according to the book of Revelation, can I say this? There will be a huge storm coming in the final hours of this earth's history to test every person on earth, including both the crowd and the disciples. We will study about that. It's about the beast and the mark of the beast. We will study. So please don't leave this moment, moments that you're having here. The point is this. Only those who have been daily and consistently Building their lives and character on Christ. The rock. By prayerfully studying the word. And obeying its principles. Will be able to go through the coming storms. Amen. Only those who have, forty, has for, who have fortified their minds. With the truth. Will be able to go forward. And see Jesus coming in the cloud of glory. Who are you? right now what is your authority right now who are you building on or which type of foundation are you building on is it on christ and his word or on what people has been saying to you all the days of your life we will hear a song right now as we close and as we hear this song may god's spirit touches your heart 